Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. So here is the bigger picture as I see it. We can imagine on a y-axis some general notion of capability, economic development, technological advancement, and on the other axis, time. And right now we have a human civilization which represents some uh, range in this condition of possible levels of civilizational advancement. If we imagine a large time scale, I think that we will break out of that human condition and the human condition will one day come to an end. The probability of this is greater the longer the time scale that we are considering. And there are two possible ways it could come to an end. One is by sort of breaking out of this range in the downwards direction. And there we have the possibility of an existential catastrophe. We could destroy ourselves. That forms an attractor state. Like once you are extinct, uh, you tend to stay extinct. And that, that's certainly a possible like permanent destination for our species. And some of the uh, powerful technologies that we will develop in this century uh, might pose serious existential risks. There is another way in which the human condition could end, and that's that we sort of break out in the upwards direction, where we get the level of capability that transforms the human condition to some radical kind of post-human condition. And again, I think there is a kind of attractor state there, which is that we or our descendants colonize the uh, accessible parts of the universe. Like once you have developed mature technology and you start spreading through space with automated colonization probes, there is really no reason why it would stop after 100,000 years or a million years. It looks like the, the natural end point of that would be that you eventually colonize everything that is within reach. And that also looks like a kind of stable state where we eventually harvest the entire cosmic endowment. I think that if we do break out in the upwards direction, that will involve the creation of superintelligence. That's certainly a very powerful technology. It's possible, as I argue, and, and it would enable the indefinite colonization of the universe. On the one hand, we have seen over long evolutionary timescales an increase in the capability of biological information processing systems, most recently with Homo sapiens. It is a big leap forward relative to what came before. More recently, we've seen uh, advances in, in the ability of, of machine uh, information processing. Uh, so they, they are kind of at a much lower level than we are at the moment, but with a faster rate of improvement. But in theory, both of these could produce uh, some form of superintelligence. And by superintelligence, I mean any kind of intellect that would radically outperform even the best humans in all practical endeavors, so including scientific creativity, social skills, general wisdom. And not just by a slight margin, but kind of radically leaving us in, in the dust. Something comparable to the difference between humans and chimpanzees. So I'll say something about biological cognition in a moment. Networks and organizations, I think, definitely important. The way we can think of us together as constituting a larger information processing unit, our collective intelligence can certainly be enhanced and has been enhanced through discoveries like the scientific method and better ways to kind of aggregate information and work together, population growth, education. Brain-computer interfaces are often mentioned as, as a path forward. I don't think that holds much promise, basically because it's very difficult to really get something that would seriously enhance a healthy human um, brain by implanting chips and stuff like that. I mean, if you want to access Google, there is no reason why you need a brain implant. You can just use your computer. And we have these like, massive, highly uh, adapted interfaces for getting information into the brain, like eyes, uh, which can transfer 100 million bits per second straight into the cortex with no medical complications. And there is a whole part of our brain that's dedicated just to extracting information from visual input. And it's very hard to, to improve on that. Like With sufficiently advanced technology, you could imagine uh, that it, it could be done and useful, but I think long before then we will have other paths to superintelligence. For people with disability, it's a different matter. I think it could be useful, useful stuff. Um, but the only way that the brain-computer interface really would boost a healthy human being, I think, is when the computer itself is so smart that it's not so much the interface, but it's like the thing outside of you. So with regard to biological cognitive enhancement, I think uh, that could be a significant factor uh, in, over the coming decades. Uh, and again, that breaks down into different possible paths. So you could have smart drugs and pharmaceutical ways of enhancing. In general, I think that looks quite difficult um, because the human 
uh, metabolic networks are very complicated. If there were a simple chemical that would radically boost human intelligence, chances are we would already have evolved to produce that chemical endogenously. So there might be some small incremental improvements from pharmaceuticals, like maybe the ability to um, have more mental energy or to concentrate better, but radical increases in sort of core cleverness. Uh, I would be much more surprised if that came from pharmaceuticals. The, the way that I think first biological intelligence uh, will be significantly increased is through genetic selection. In the context of in vitro fertilization, currently it's standard practice to produce maybe eight, 10 embryos. Now you then have to select one of those embryos to implant. And at the moment, we are doing that by basically trying to avoid implanting an embryo that looks like it might have some genetic disease. But we don't have the ability yet to select for some interesting trait like intelligence. But once we are able to conduct large genome-wide association studies with hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, maybe even tens of millions of subjects, I think we will be able to identify the genetic architecture of variation in the um, additively heritable component of general intelligence. And these studies are just now becoming possible because it turns out that what accounts for, to, to the extent that intelligence is heritable, what accounts for that difference in genetic disposition to intelligence is not just a few genes, but it's a lot of genes that each have a very, very small effect. So to detect the effect of a gene that has a very, very small effect, you need a very large sample, like millions of people perhaps. And until now, it has been infeasible to do that kind of study. Only now is the price of gene sequencing coming down that one can contemplate. So I think that over the coming uh, few years, five years or 10 years perhaps, uh, we, will, we will find a significant uh, fraction of, of the genetic foundation for variations in intelligence. Now once you have that and once you overcome, either accommodate or ignore, uh, as the case might be, different kinds of ethical objections you might have, uh, then you could use this in the course of standard IVF. It doesn't require any new technology. We already can pick out an embryo. You would just put take a, a cell and sequence it and then use that to select. A more powerful version of this will uh, become available if you have an additional technology that is not yet quite developed, but that would greatly potentiate the ability to select. And that would be the ability to do iterated embryo selection. And this additional technology that would be required for this is the ability to use uh, a stem cell that you could extract from an embryo and then use from that stem cell to produce gametes, like sperm cell and egg cell. This would enable you to compact the generation cycle from the normal 20, 30 years down to maybe a couple of months. And it would enable you to circumvent having to have people change their reproductive behavior and you could do it all in a petri dish. Then what you would do is to, you, would, you would have an embryo, you have a little pool of embryo, like maybe 10, and you select the best one. Uh, then you produce new gametes from that, use those to generate more embryos, select the best one and you repeat perhaps five, 10 times. And this technology would enable you to get vastly greater selection power than just doing a one-shot selection. Um, so this, this, this missing technology here, uh, the ability to create gametes from, from stem cells, um, is not yet available in humans. It has been done in mice, so we know that it's possible. Uh, it's not been adopted for human use. And there might be sort of, as often with biotechnology, the, the details get messy when you try to get it to work reliably enough to be suitable for human use. So there's more uncertainty as to when this will be available. Um, but here are some estimates that um, uh, we've done regarding what the effect would be of different kinds of selection, assuming you use this selection for intelligence. So if you have two ordinary embryos in the context of in vitro fertilization and you just pick the one that looks like it has the highest um, genetic predisposition to intelligence, you would only get an expected gain of four IQ points. If you select one in 10 embryos, you get more. One in 100, one in 1,000, you can see you get more and more, but they're like steeply diminishing returns. But once you do this iterated embryo selection, you can see here that, for example, doing five generations of picking one in 10 gives you vastly more than doing the best of one in 50. And when you can do 10 generations of that, you basically have the ability to push the human genome to its maximum. You might get an, a phenotype of intelligence that actually has never been represented in human history if you do that. Um, it's that powerful. You can think about that kind of technology a little bit like sort of proofreading the human genome. So it looks like what accounts for a lot of variation is that we have different amounts of genetic noise that kind of drags down our performance. We all have it, maybe hundreds of mutations, each one of which 
has a negligible effect, but a slight deleterious effect. And, and because you have hundreds of them, that kind of limit the uh, efficiency of various cellular processes. But with this kind of technology, you could be able to edit that out of your genome, so all the kind of little genetic defects. It's a little bit analogous to the phenomenon you get when you superimpose pictures. So this was generated by an Israeli artist. He took a lot of pictures of citizens. And what you find is that when you superimpose picture after picture, you sort of tend to get these striking and, and fairly attractive pictures at the end because you kind of average out all the imperfections. Um, and proofreading the genome would be a little bit like that in the sense that you would kind of take the consensus genome that, that would remove all the things that are wrong with each one of us. Um, I think that this is quite likely to happen over a time scale of a few decades, which means that if we're considering events that might take place, say, after mid-century, by that time, there might well be a cohort of, of, of enhanced children who have grown up. Uh, and so the further out you're looking at the future, particularly post-mid-century, uh, you have to consider that the problems that we will be struggling with then will probably be tackled by people who might be quite different from us because there might be uh, first or second generation uh, genetic enhancements that, that are coming into play then, increasingly as time goes by. Because that, that's obviously not the end state either. You will have more advanced technologies beyond that. So some people might argue that because having machines surpass us seem like a dangerous thing, what we should do is to turbocharge attempts to boost human cognition uh, so that we can keep up with the machines. I think it would work exactly the opposite, that the more we enhance biological intelligence, the sooner machines will surpass us. Um, because uh, the, the cleverer we will be in our efforts to create AI, the smarter the AI researchers will be, the mathematicians, etc. We think of AI, the history of AI, we might like, remember various milestones. Deep Blue, when uh, Garry Kasparov was defeated. Um, chess was regarded as kind of the epitome of human intellection. It was like the paradigmatic task that required like real human thinking. After computers surpassed us, we no longer think of it as, as such a sort of high-level intellectual task. And AI researchers tend to complain about this, right? As soon as something works, it's no longer called AI. The goalpost keeps moving. Self-driving cars, various kinds of scary-looking robotics, and most recently, perhaps, uh, Watson's uh, triumph in the uh, Jeopardy quiz show. But behind those kind of occasional blips on the like the media radar, what underlies all of this is innovation in, in the basic underlying algorithms, the basic techniques, technologies that are, that are used in AI. And there have been a number of these. Most of this discovery could only really be done once you had computers. So it's really not that long in the scheme of things. We might think if all of this progress has happened within the past lifetime of some people who are today, we might expect as much in the lifetime of some people who are currently here. And just as important as the uh, software improvements have been, uh, have been improvements in hardware. And if you look at a particular application domain like chess, and, and you, you, you ask why are the chess computers today better than they were in the 90s or in the 80s, you find roughly half of the progress is due to algorithmic improvement, and half is just due to us having faster hardware. So one possible path towards machine intelligence is this AI approach. Another path is to try to pick a general intelligence system that already exists, that we have available, the human brain, and try to reverse engineer it. Either just finding the general principles and drawing inspiration from that, or at the limiting case, copying a particular human brain. So this would be the approach known as whole brain emulation, where you would take a particular brain, freeze it or, or vitrify it, then slice it up into very thin slices, feed those slices through an array of powerful microscopes to image each slice, then use automated image recognition software to, to, to extract from this stack of two-dimensional pictures the three-dimensional connectivity matrix in the neural network that was implemented in the original brain, and then using neurocomputational models to run that three-dimensional structure in a powerful computer. So the first stage would result in these kinds of pictures. This is an electron micrograph you would need. You, you can actually see quite a lot of detail there if you know what you're looking for, synapses connecting neurons. We certainly have the right kind of resolution. I mean, we can see individual atoms if we want. It's just very slow to image a whole brain at that level. So you need a lot of progress in microscopy. Then uh, we can already do this kind of thing today. This is uh, extracted using automated image recognition software from a, from a scanned lump of tissue. But we'd, it's kind of unreliable, and you need a lot of progress in image recognition. And then probably you need some progress in hardware as well. It's possible that our fastest supercomputers could 
run this kind of thing if we had the software, but probably need a bit more. From a technological point of view, we're very far from being able to do this. However, what this would not require is any theoretical leap forward. There is no conceptual breakthrough. This just requires much more technology. Whereas the classical AI approach, it looks like there is some unknown number of these basic discoveries that will still have to be made. And we don't know whether it's like five or 10 or 20, but some kind of conceptual leap is probably required to get that to work. But the fact that there are these multiple paths increases the probability that the destination will eventually be reached. So we have a lot of applications already for AI, kind of in the background, a lot of them don't think of as AI. Just in the last couple of years, there has kind of been a search of, of interest in the whole area. Watson have been a number of high level, high profile acquisitions. Like here in London, there was a big AI company, DeepMind, that was acquired last year by Google for 400 million. And there's like a race on Facebook has tried to acquire other AI companies to keep in the race. Um, but, but these kind of bubbles, the hype bubble and the disappointment bubbles, there have been several cycles of that in the history of AI. So I don't think that those gives out very much evidence. You can look at particular domains where it's easy to compare uh, computer performance to human performance, like game AI. Uh, and there we, we see that computers are, are ahead of us in many of them. But game situations are usually particularly easy for computers because they have clearly defined rules. They don't require much background knowledge. Performance at more practical relevant tasks is lagging far behind. We did a little um, survey among some experts um, where we asked them, by what year do you think there is a 10, 15, 90% probability that we will have human level machine intelligence. The median answer to that was that the experts thought there were a 50% chance that we will have human level machine intelligence by the year 2050. And these are the subjective opinions of, of people and the track record of forecasting in this field is not that great, but at least it suggests that it's not a ridiculous proposition to think that this could happen within our lifetime. We also asked how long they thought it would be from that point till we get super intelligence. I disagree somewhat with these two. So my view is that when we will have human level, the, the idea that there is a 90% chance that we will have it by 2070, I, I think is overconfident that the track record of human predicting these kinds of breakthroughs is quite poor. And we should smear out our probability distribution over a wider range of arrival dates, and particularly the tail end. On the other hand, with this, um, I think there is a much greater probability that if and do, when we do get human level machine intelligence, that we will have super intelligence shortly after. I think one should take seriously even scenarios in which this could happen within hours, minutes, or days, um, as well as scenarios in which it takes a few years. I, I don't see it taking decades. There are two kind of questions you need to distinguish quite carefully. Um, so if this is who we are now, there is the question of how far away we are from AI. And this is the question that I think we should be quite agnostic about. That doesn't mean we should ignore the possibility that it happens soon. It's that we should think in terms of a probability distribution. And then there's the second question, which is when we do reach that level, how soon after will we have superintelligence? And there, I think, we have quite good reasons to think that that takeoff duration will be very short. That has a consequence that if the takeoff duration is very short, you have, in effect, an intelligence explosion. Like once you reach a critical mass, the whole thing become super intelligent over a short period of time. Now, suppose that this takes place over one week, say. So you have some AI system that becomes sufficiently smart, and it can start to apply its intelligence to improving itself. And then one week later, you have something radical and super intelligent. In that kind of scenario, it's likely that there will only be one super intelligence, right? Because it's unlikely that there will be two different products developing AI that will be so close to one another, that they will both be undergoing the transition at the same time, if it only takes a week to do it. Like if it takes decades, then many products, nations, companies will be doing, having roughly comparable capability. But in a fast takeoff scenario, you basically have one that have completed the scenario before the next one have started it. So you have some project, some system that attains radical superintelligence in a world where there is as yet no even close peer. That superintelligence then becomes extremely powerful and quite likely able to shape the future according to its desires and preferences. Everything then depends on exactly what the preferences of this first superintelligent system is. That then poses this fundamental challenge. It looks like the human era is coming uh, to an end at some point. We don't know exactly when. It might well be in the center at some point. Hopefully, it's not coming to an end by blowing ourselves up and going extinct, but that we actually get a shot at this intelligence transition to superintelligence. But that transition itself is extremely dangerous. We'll create something that will be able to shape the entire future according to its preferences. And the basic challenge then is, how could you solve the control problem? How could you control the outcome of such an intelligence explosion?